Hi, welcome to Visual Studio Toolbox. I'm your host, Robert Green, and joining me today is Steve Jones from Redgate. Hi. Steve's here to talk about database DevOps. That's right. And we, uh, we chatted at Build. We, uh, did. we did a show at Build, and we covered some of this stuff uh, then, but we're going to do it in a bit of a more deep dive and get a little bit more into the meat behind it. Okay, uh, let's do it. Right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, absolutely. So we're going to talk about two things. We're going to talk about two different ways of doing the database DevOps. Uh, right. First that we're going to cover today is uh, migrations. migrations, and then the second one is uh, database compare. Right. right, data compare. Have you ever done migrations when you've developed yes. database software? Yep. Do you like migrations? Do I like migrations? I, it's a tool and stuff gets done, so I like I like stuff that works. But I don't have a passion one way or another for it. Let's okay. put it that way. Yeah, I, I find a lot of people don't either do or don't like migrations. I I've done a lot of migrations uh, more in the Oracle and DB2 world, where uh, you know large ERP systems often just track all the scripts. There are hundreds of developers, right? And then we run them all in order, mm -hmm. and uh, it always works, but it can be really slow sometimes. Okay. Uh, so some people don't like migrations, but uh, I, I prefer it. You know, and, and I work for Redgate Software. We we support both ways of doing database development, so whatever works for you uh, is fine, and maybe you'll pick one or the other after this. <laughs> I, but at least I'll learn how they both work. At right, the end of this. exactly. We're doing, so at the end of these two parts. Yes. All right. All right. Migrations first. So migrations first. Um, Let's back up a step okay, before we dive see. in. What are we doing? So uh, I'm a, a database person. I've been a SQL Server person for most of my career. I've mm -hmm. actually been working with SQL Server for 26 years now. So uh, more than half my life has been spent <laughs> working with databases at this point, <laughs> right? So it's, it's kind of amazing that throughout that time, I've developed software in a number of different ways as a DBA and developer. And so I've tried to work through these different ways of efficiently getting database changes to production, mm -hmm. uh, making sure that I'm not interrupting an application, I'm not causing downtime unnecessarily, uh, certainly, I'm not causing any data integrity issues or losing anything along the way. Right. So, so you know, you make code changes all the time, but you're saying that uh, how often do, do people make database changes? Not as much as code changes, obviously. But not as much as code changes, right? The database, because we have to maintain that state of our data, mm -hmm. right? unlike unlike uh, an application, right? I can drop a class, I can add a method, I can make these changes, and I kind of just replace different versions of right. code. Right? Yep. XEs, DLLs, assemblies, resources, whatever it is. Uh, I can do that with some of my code in the database world, my views, my procedures, things like that, but my tables I have to keep around, so I'm always kind of evolving them. Okay. And because I have to do that, especially as my database grows larger, I want to be careful how often I make those changes. Right? Right. Renaming a table is, is disruptive because uh, unlike renaming something in Visual Studio, uh, the compiler can find all the references or the yep. IDE can find all the references and do that. For database, I also have connections coming from various places and I don't know what's happening. Right. So I, I think it depends on a lot of times the maturity of your application. If you're starting out, you may make more database changes mm -hmm. than later. Yeah. Right? Okay. As uh, I grow, I, I get a lot of technical debt kind of in my database world because of all those connections to other applications, reports, ETL systems. Right. So I'm hesitant to make those changes. Okay. Now there are people that do a lot of additive changes where they just add things to the tables, they add systems to the, or objects to the database so that they don't, hopefully don't disrupt those applications, mm -hmm. right? And they can continue to add features and functionality throughout the lifetime of their application. Okay. Right? So one of the things I've, you know, I've been doing really for most of my life is a lot of things we call DevOps, right? Trying to have lightweight processes that work, that help me make changes in an efficient manner without causing problems. And mm -hmm. in the last three or four years, all of a sudden we have a name, we call it DevOps. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we, we DevOps all the things now, I think, right. as, a, as Donovan Brown might say. Yep. So, um, so let me, maybe I'll show you some things here. Okay. So I work for Redgate Software, and we have Ready Rolls included in Visual Studio Enterprise. Yep. So that's part of what's there, and I have a little Ready Roll toolbar here that comes up, and that's a pane in Visual Studio. And my project in Ready Roll is just like any other project. So if I were to create a new project here, and since we don't want to run through everything, uh, Ready Roll appears just like my database project would for SSDT or for C Sharp or any other type of application that we have in Visual Studio. In this case, the Ready Roll project builds off of a database project, which uh, is slow to come up. But you can see okay. that there's uh, database projects like we would do in 
for SSDT through data mm -hmm. tools, or yeah. I've got ready roll projects here. And the difference is the database project works as uh, tracking all the changes and then it does a comparison with SQL package and it'll deploy those changes. Mm -hmm. And I kind of package everything on the DAC pack. In ready roll, we have what we call migrations. So in this existing projects, I've made a bunch of changes over time. You can see I've got all these scripts. And each one of these is just a change that I made to my database uh, as I was performing development. So in this case, I'm altering the table. Uh, obviously, I can't so alter. So you wrote those scripts uh, and then saved them in the project, right? Yep. I actually have a couple okay. ways of doing it. I can import those changes if I've made this in Management Studio or another mm, developer has okay. made changes. So I can ensure that I'm capturing all the changes. Or I could write the script directly. Okay. So Ready Roll, uh, what it does is it takes the burden off of you of trying to manually grab every script, make sure you've caught all the changes, giving it a name, and saving mm -hmm. it off. Right, okay. I, so I can do that. So over time, I just collect these different changes that uh, could be DDL changes, they could be DML changes. They're just a series of things that I'm doing to my database. Mm -hmm. I'm creating objects, I'm altering objects, whatever is appropriate for my application. So in this case, this is a common pattern that in the SSDT world or in a state-based comparison world is mm -hmm. difficult to handle. I've got to add a not null column, mm -hmm. but I've got data in my table. Right. So I can't add a not null column. Right, I have to add a null column, update some data, and then add a not null right. change. Yep. So that's a complex change. But I still haven't changed that. Uh, <laughs> it's been that way forever. Uh, right. Yeah. I yeah. mean, there, there are ways around it. I could add a default. I could do some right. things. But uh, for a lot of systems, I've worked with a lot of developers. This is a problematic mm -hmm. item because I don't want a default value. What I need to do is populate that appropriately with some value that matters right. for that row of data. Okay. So uh, ReadyRoll makes these types of changes uh, much more robust and resilient. So where's the migration ID come from there? So let me show you how this is done. We'll create a migration script now. So if I want to create a new script, uh, I could certainly just right click and add like anything else. Mm -hmm. I could certainly add a stored procedure, a table, or anything that I want to do. So when I do my development... So there's the migration ID that gets created when you create the script. That gets created when I create the script. Okay. So it gives me a unique way of identifying this script and tracking whether it's been deployed in any environment. Okay. All right. So we do that. So let me create a little procedure here that I want to do, and that'll just give me something that I can run. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I can certainly run this if I want. Uh, I have a variety of options like I would in uh, any other database development that I'm doing that I mm -hmm. can just uh, mark my code, run it, test it, do everything that I need to do here. Yep. Uh, this has been executed on a local instance. It actually exists there, so I can uh, run any of my application against it. I have all the ability to do the work that I do normally as a database developer. Okay. And then, you know, periodically what I want to do is I want to make sure that I've deployed everything in my project. So I can click here and it'll do a build in Visual Studio like anything else. So mm -hmm. I know that popped quickly up there, but uh, I actually have a conflict and something failed. Already an object named get 10? Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. So it thinks it's still there. But I don't think that that's the case, so let's just check. I'm more we, comfortable. Who are you going to uh, believe? Who am I going to believe? <laughs> it does exist. I think because I ran it and then I said it was deployed. Alright. Let's deploy it again and do a build because uh, I'm a developer, I'm human, I make mistakes. Right? Things happen as I'm going. Let's see. It deployed, it succeeded, everything's okay, good there. Okay, cool. So I can kind of see what's going on in my project as I'm performing development because I have the code and scripts. I could certainly check the database against this. Mm -hmm. I've got uh, everything like I would normally have. This migration ID is, is how the framework will actually check if this script has been run. Okay. So inside of my database, we actually track that. So if I pop over here, and let's just check it from here. There's this migration log. And we can see here that this contains uh, all of the migrations that have been run. So there's this GUID that we have, there's a checksum to make sure that the script I think ran is the correct script, right? I haven't edited or changed mm -hmm. it, and I have the file name and then various other metadata that lets me know what's going on. So this ensures that uh, my scripts, in essence, will only run once, so I can't do something like add data in a script and then worry about it being added again, right. duplicate data, recreate in tables, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. okay? So, so far as I go through database development, uh, it's similar to what I might do in C Sharp or any other language. Right. Right. That I'm just kind of working with my project and making changes. And like any other change, this kind of appears as uh, part of my team explorer. 
right? I've hooked up to version control, which is one of those things that I find so many database developers don't do, right? They don't track their DDL, yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, and, and that's so one thing we want to do. You've deployed this to the database already? In my development database. Right, okay. So I'm working with an in development database, and I've got this change out there. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I and I can certainly make other changes. And let me show you something else because uh, I do find there's a lot of developers that like to work in Manager Studio still because it's a comfortable way of working mm -hmm. and uh, it's quick. So let me add a piece of data here to this table, and if I look at what's in here, I've got some data in there. So I just added okay. row number five. So one of the things Ready Roll also allows us to do is track reference data or static data that I might want to include as I deploy this further. Mm -hmm. All right, so here's, here's a value that I want to include. Well, once I've done that in ReadyRoll, what I want to periodically do is check, have I, has anybody made any changes outside of Visual Studio? Certainly, I could have just done run a query on Visual Studio as well that did that same insert. We can see here that I've actually detected there's a data change here. In, in fact, uh, there's one row that was inserted. So I can add this as another script, and this will come in as another migration script. This is script 32. It's got a different migration ID, which you'll have to trust me that's the case. <laughs> we won't compare that. <laughs> but ReadyRoll has built me an insert statement. Uh, it could build me an update statement. It could build me a delete statement, w whatever would be appropriate here. Uh, and again, that's here inside of a change in the Team Explorer as well. Mm -hmm. all right, so all of this is my local development as a database developer. My laptop, my workstation, I'm doing my thing. Right. So are you committing this to version control as a way of keeping track of the history? Because these you changed the database, right? It's a little bit different than writing code. It's a little bit Isn't different. Isn't it? It's a little different, right? Because certainly anything I do to a table or to data has to, is, is kind of this evolutionary change of things. Mm -hmm. right, that I, I'm if moving from one state to the next constantly. Um, I'm tracking it in version control, uh, A, because I make mistakes and sometimes I have to go backwards. Okay. Right? Uh, just the, the way of the world, sometimes I will misinterpret a requirement, the business person will tell me the wrong requirement, and we will write code and realize it doesn't work. So as we can expect. roll back the database changes. Well, we can certainly find out what we changed so okay. that we can go back. I can certainly go to version control and grab those changes. Right. Uh, rolling back database changes is not always easy. Yeah, because it's not like the data is in source control, the history data's, of the data. It's that you not. You can go back to a snapshot. Right. Uh, now, for uh, stored procedures and functions and views, I can just grab that previous code. Right, because those are just code. Those are just yes. code. Yes, okay. For tables, uh, I haven't come across a tool yet, nor would I think would I trust my job to a tool to roll back my da table right, changes. Exactly. Right, exactly. Because if that if there's been data added to the table, mm -hmm. I need to decide what to do with that data. Right. right? If I've dropped a column, which is a, a very dangerous thing, uh, I need to have prepared for that in advance because nothing is rolling bringing me that table change back. Right. Right. right? Okay. So those are different, but as much as possible, I'm trying to treat all my database code like application code. Mm -hmm. okay. And part of this is that I want to use this code to move forward uh, to do CI and do CD just right. like I would do with an application. Okay. Right. So let me commit this. We'll see this out there. Actually, before I commit this, let's just go look. Uh, I've got a project out here in Visual Studio Team Services, which I think is fantastic, mm -hmm. by the way. Mm -hmm. I think You're right, is, it is. This is maybe the best developer tool I've seen Microsoft ever build. Uh, now, the Visual Studio Team Service is just amazing. It really is. And I use it all the time. So I've got you know, a board like I would have for anything else, and I can track all my database work. Yep. And I've got my code here as well, and I've got my project. So I've got my main database project, my test project, because I want to test things, mm -hmm. um, you know, and various items. And if I flip down in here and look at my migrations, yeah. and my last okay. change uh, was this morning. Right. A little while ago, we were checking things out. Let's go ahead and commit this change. So we'll say channel nine with Robert. We'll call it one. Let's commit and push that. So once I do that, this will actually push up into the Microsoft I remember cloud. the first time I looked closely at that drop down and saw that commit and push, you could do all at once instead of committing and then going and finding push. This, that might be the <laughs> one thing I wish existed. <laughs> instead of a drop down, it would just give me the option to remember that. Ooh, that'd be even better. Right? Yeah. 
But if I, let's refresh this so that I see what's out there. Uh, I should see we just pushed out two changes. Okay. Right? So it tracked two new scripts. Yep. Right? And uh, now I have a history of what's going on because in the migrations world, I'm tracking all these scripts over time. So that's an interesting best practice. You've got two changes and one comment. So given that you're all the rest of your comments are pretty descriptive. Would you then typically just commit one script at a time? It depends on the work that I'm doing at that. You know, I, I, that's kind of a developer, developer philosophical question, right? Do I include multiple changes into one commit? Mm -hmm. uh, I would have that option, just like I do with anything in Visual Studio. I could pick right. and choose what commits. Uh, in this case, if I was, if that data change was associated with the stored procedure change, I would probably commit them together. Uh, with the work item and, and, and a better description, of course. Right, that, that's right. That's not yeah. a great comment. Uh, but if they were separate items, as, as is the case sometimes in the database world, mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't make two separate commits. Okay. And, and that's, one, that's one of those things that comes along with you being a developer, learning how to commit in batches or singly as right. appropriate. Yep. Right? That takes your experience there. Okay. So we, we've, we can make our changes here and commit them, but we want to go further, right? Because this is a great safety net in version control, but uh, it's not helping me build software faster. Mm -hmm. right? It's not helping me build software better either. Right. So I want to make sure that I'm actually building things as well. And the build system in Visual Studio Team Service is fantastic as well. I mean, uh, I've watched people build all kinds of stuff here, mm -hmm. that uh, from, from Java to Python to C Sharp to database code, everything. Right. It's just amazing. And we can see here, uh, we've actually just built a, uh, a new build here. So when you created that ago. build, was there a built-in template that you got to select, or did you have to build it from scratch? I actually built it from scratch. Now, okay. uh, if those of you who haven't used Visual Studio Team Services, you should give it a try. But it's a very build simple step-based system. Project. Yeah, just like you would do for C Sharp, I'm doing okay. a Visual Studio build, and this is just the standard Visual Studio build task. So oh, 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 okay. So you named that build. I named it, right? So okay. I can I can change the name, right, right here mm -hmm. in the display. Okay. But this is the standard Visual Studio build task. Okay. Got so uh, if there were, if if I was doing C sharp in the same solution. Right. Let's not restart now. Let's not do that. <laughs> so if I were doing a C sharp project in the same solution, I could build it here. I could have two Visual Studio builds to okay. build each project separately. Mm -hmm whatever is appropriate for my system, but uh, you know, I'm doing the same solution build. You know, I've, I've specified the name. I've got the MS build arguments just like I would normally have. Okay. Uh, Ready Roll wants to build against another database, a target database, where I'm going to deploy to. So uh, I give it a parameter to say, okay, just where so, am I going to deploy? So here's a question. So when you wrote the script, you deployed it. So you already changed the database, right? Correct. Now you've got a continuous integration build, what is that doing? So, what it's doing is, is going through and reevaluating the entire script to make sure that uh, everything's correct. It's looking against uh, a, a downstream environment that I would want to send it to to evaluate okay. which of these changes okay. may want so to So, you forward. just changed the, like, a development database. Yes. Confirmed that it all works, and now you're using the CI process to update the production database or a, a further downstream database? I'm doing a downstream database. So I never, I always like to work in multiple environments. Okay. And these days with containers and virtualization and VMs, I always try to have at least three environments, if not more. So in this mm -hmm. case, I've actually got five. So one of the things you want to do is I'll make my changes, but you want to be able to see my changes as mm -hmm. well, right? Or we want to see all of our code together just like we would in a C Sharp project yep. web app. So in this build, what I'm actually doing is I'm building and I'm running my tests. Mm -hmm. So I'm seeing uh, I've got the Microsoft unit testing project as part of this. So I'm, I'm running tests in there against my database. So I'm doing SQL Server unit tests. And I'm doing my artifacts. And if I pop back to the summary of what's going on, and we'll look at that, the actually results of that build that just ran. And what we'll find uh, it, it, you know, it took a few seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, my test ran successfully. Yep. Uh, I could see, you know, the commits that are going against it, uh, any warnings, anything that I've got going on. In this case, because it looked at that next environment over here on the right, I see which migrations weren't applied to my next database. Oh, 
Okay. So that gives me an integration place. And as a matter of fact, you can see that there, it knows which stored procedure was changed there, right? So it's kind of read through some of the metadata that I could see what's going on. And as a further step out of this build, I'm actually triggering a release as well. And where do you specify what database it's going to? Is that part of the build definition? That is part of the build definition. So when I pop over here, that is a parameter Visual Studio like I would add any other parameter. And you'll see here that I've said this build integration database oh, is where I'm going to target okay. next. Got it. So that's okay. giving me kind of this intermediate environment. I see. And if I pop over to my Visual Studio, let's see, or sorry, my management studio, let's grab this query right here. Let's copy this, and this is my integration database. Okay. Okay. So we didn't touch this database. You know, I've got a different coloring on it, mm -hmm. but my row number five has been added. Got it. And my stored procedure here should run. Cool. Right. So cool, cool, uh, cool. right now I've I've done the process that I would normally do with C sharp, and that I take mm -hmm. my code, take everybody else's code put it together, generate an artifact, and we can then see if that is what we actually want. So you, your continuous integration there is actually a deployment as well? It, it is to another environment because in the, the database world, I, I kind of need a place to go look at that stuff. Right. So I've, I've actually moved this from one environment to the next. So let me zoom in slightly here. Uh, I started right here in this development area. So mm -hmm. this is where I made the change. And this is uh, environment two right here where we yep. just sent that change. Okay. okay. And what I want to do then is, of course, I've got QA, yep. uh, I've got this staging, and I've got production as well. Right? So I want to kind of make sure my code flows, obviously testing at each point in time, running an application against it, mm -hmm. having other developers, QA people, et cetera, look at what's going on, right. including business people. So I want to make sure that my code is being deployed. So let me grab, uh, let's grab all this code real quick. And let me just look at my QA environment, right? So if I run this now, that store procedure doesn't exist in QA. Right. Yep. Right? Neither does that row of right. data. Because your build definition only sent it to the first database. Yeah, my build definition build actually uh, kicked off this release process as part of continuous delivery. So this release process says, once I've built, if I've built successfully, mm -hmm. and if I've passed my tests, whatever's appropriate for myself, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just deploy this package out to a database. And in this case, I'm sending it to my integration environment. Oh, so the build doesn't actually do the deploying. No, no. In this case, uh, oh, okay. Let me pop to the old editor. This new editor has gotten slightly odd for me, but. Uh, when I look at this build process, or sorry, this release process, this is set <laughs> as the options here. Where they moved yeah, everything. Yeah, go back on. to the first. Here. Click on one phase, one task. That's where it is. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, here I'm actually having this kick off. As once the build is successful, okay. it triggers this release. Okay. All right. So, uh, just like I want to do is I want to have uh, kind of an organized process that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, outside of the pathing and the parameters, uh, we could set this up in a couple of minutes. Okay. Right? We would have right. to go through the pathing, make sure we haven't uh, yep. made anything incorrect there. But I, I have the ability to do that. Uh, but I've also got other release processes in place. In this case, I've got a downstream process as well which will push it to those other environments. Okay. So I have the ability to uh, make releases in a consistent, reliable fashion, mm -hmm. uh, in a way that, as a DBA, uh, it, various times in my career I've struggled with. Right? Because I, somebody sends me a script, I have to look right. at it, uh, I have to hope all the objects are included. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have to hope that I've actually remembered to correct, connect to the correct server, right. send it down there, right? all the minutia that um, just slows down development. Right. It just becomes complexity. Just like uh, deploying um, an ASP.NET website or a C Sharp to thick client, you know, there. I have to make sure I go through all the process correctly. I have to remember that uh, I need to copy it to these folders, to these servers, mm -hmm. right? Th those things are just, they're kind of tedious things that we don't want in general to do. Right. So 
uh, having this stuff happen automatically in a, in a lightweight process like Visual Studio Team Services makes it really easy to move those changes forward yep. awesome. and see what works. And so uh, this release is created. Uh, it's probably run by now because usually they run fairly quickly. And if I come back over here and let's rerun this code, uh, it actually works this Excellent. time. All right, so I moved it to QA. Yeah. And we could certainly repeat that forward yep. to the other environments as well. All right, so cool. uh, trying to build some of that DevOps process in here is that I, I make the process a definition that is always handled in the same way. It's always right. executed the same manner. And then uh, if I find issues or if they find new requirements, I can slowly modify that. But I'm not dependent on a human to do mm -hmm. that. Right. right. And it gives you the ability to uh, not necessarily be the only one making changes to the database. Just like in coding, you're not the only one coding, right? The, right. One of the things about the continuous integration is I make changes on my machine, I run my tests, everything works. You make changes on your machine, run your tests, everything works. Marry the code together, doesn't stuff work. doesn't work anymore. Exactly. Right. The CI will do that. I check in my code, you check in your code, all the unit tests run, we're told immediately. You, you could apply the same process here. I make changes to the database, works on my machine, you make changes, works on your machine, um, and then you marry them together and it all then goes downstream. And hopefully works, right? But if hopefully, it doesn't, of course. And if it doesn't, then the process we know, breaks. But we and know now you quickly, know why, right? right? Yeah. yeah. So I've got all, cool. You know, Visual Studio Team Services gives me all the instrumentation to say yep. what was deployed, what's included, uh, so I don't have to dig through the entire database. I know yep. in this case there's two files that broke, so if, if my code doesn't work with your code, yep. uh, we know which files I committed to go look at. And this isn't that hard to learn how to do. It's pretty easy to set up. It is pretty easy to set up. Yeah, even, yeah. even if the UI changes. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it is. I mean, uh, Visual Studio Team Service, I was amazed yeah. at how easy it is to actually do a build after working in something like Jenkins, which works great, but it's not the easiest thing right. to work with. Yep. So uh, Visual Studio Team Services and all the extensions have made this a smooth process. Very cool. All right. All right. Do we learn cool. something? You, you like migrations and database development now? I love it, yeah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> well, I love the fact that, that you can, that uh, DevOps and CICD, continuous integration, continuous deployment, pipelines are for databases too. It's not just for code. Right. And you can just as easily set one up for your database stuff as you can for your code. I love that. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's one of those things that will really help improve the quality of our database applications yep. as we move forward. Oh, absolutely. So. Cool. So that's part one. Part one. Part two. We're part two, do we'll do this again, but we'll do it uh, in, a, in a comparison method where mm -hmm. we're not going to try to track every change. We'll right. just figure it out later. Okay. Cool. We'll see you next time on Visual Studio Toolbox.